hope that like looking, gazing continually out the window will bring Charlie. But uh, yeah, he'll be where he's at regardless. Right there. No. 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 Well, happy birthday, Sophia. Come on in. Thank you. Hi, We're in Isaiah chapter forty-five. I look at a passage of scripture. Uh, I have been conscientiously for the past year or so uh, trying to every time I find a New Testament of the Scripture, an Old Testament quotation, especially when it says "as it is written," uh, I've been trying to search out the Scripture, find where it was written, and what was written. And this would be another passage of Scripture similar to that. And uh, it, every time I Every time I do that, every time I say, see something in the New Testament and then it refers to something in the Old Testament that's written, I'm always reminded just of how rich the Scripture is, and how much truth there is, and how simple uh, God's plan always has been. I'd like to read our text tonight beginning in verse 20 of Isaiah 45. The command begins, Assemble yourselves and come. Draw near together, ye that are escaped of the nations. They have no knowledge that set up the wood of their graven image and pray unto a God that cannot save. Tell ye, and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this from ancient time? Who hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord, and there is no God else beside me. A just God and a Savior, there is none beside me. Look unto me, and be ye saved all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is none else. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness, and shall not return. Then unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear, surely shall one say, In the Lord have I righteousness and strength. Even him, in him, even to him shall men come, and all that are incensed against him shall be ashamed. And the Lord shall all the seed of Israel be justified, and shall glory. Father, we pray tonight that you would help us to look at this prophecy of the Scripture, which we know to be true because of our experience, and which all will know to be true eventually because of their experience. And I pray that you would help us to have just a more concrete understanding of the way of salvation, the simplicity of it, and God, the exclusivity of our Savior. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. What's the passage of Scripture that is dealing with, of course, a Israel that is rebellious and God is speaking of future judgment for His people Israel. But like much of the Scripture when God is speaking to Israel, God is not excluding the other nations of the earth. He's including the other nations of the earth. Look at verse, uh, verse 20. The Bible first of all the Bible first of all points out what the alternative of looking to God is. And I just want to simply say this evening, what we're going to find in our text is that God has always been exclusive. He's always said, I am the only way. And everybody will know it. And people, it seems always in their hearts, that's really the major issue they have with God. Most people are okay with God being a means for worship, a person to worship, a means for eternal life or salvation, but God being the only way, the only God, people have a problem with that. Let me just say, logically speaking, there's no problem with God being God. The, the, the diagnostic, what it, what it reflects on the heart of a person who has a problem, I can see it who has a problem with God being the only means for eternal life, what is exposed by that mindset simply is that uh, we have rebellious natures and hearts. And we don't like to bow to anyone, even God. I don't know how many times I've had people say something along the lines to me of, if you believed that Jesus was the way for eternal life, for you, I'd be okay with that. But then they'll say, but you shouldn't believe that He's the only way 
for everybody. We're in Isaiah 45 if you've just come in. Where verse 20 is the verse we're about to reread. The problem with that statement, it seems reasonable, and I've always answered people, yes, I do believe that Jesus is the only way. I've had a lot of people say that. Many, many people have phrased it differently, but many people have said, you know, it just bothers me that you think that it's only Jesus that can get you to God. Why would someone be bothered by that? Well, I'll give you a couple of reasons offhand. One reason people be bothered by that, of course, would be rebellion. But specifically, they're bothered because it's a narrow way. It doesn't leave room, doesn't leave room for a person's pride. It doesn't leave room for idols. It doesn't leave room, leave room for their way. Friend, the problem with our problem is that God is God and we're not. You know, God's right to be God ought to be indisputed, but we want to dispute it, don't we? Why does God get to be God? You tell me. Why does God get to be God? Because He's God. Because He is, first of all. All right, why else? Okay, he always has been, so that goes along with he is. Yeah, okay, why else? I don't know. There is no one. He created us. Because of what he's done, he created us. In other words, where do we get off being created and trying to tell the Creator what we were made for? God knows why he made us, doesn't he? God's the one who made us. And it is ridiculous, actually, to think that the person who is God because He is, and because He's always been, and He is the person... I mean, one of the things about being God is that creator aspect. We haven't created anything. We haven't made anything. You say, oh, Pastor, I'm very creative. Oh, you may be creative like compared to me, as in you're artistic, or you like to make weird stuff or something, or you see beauty in things that are ugly. You may be creative in that sense. <laughs> But the fact of the matter is, is that you've never made something out of nothing. And you certainly haven't done anything to the degree of complexity of everything God has made. Take a microscope sometime and examine little things that God's made. Try to look at the design of a leaf sometime. At the cells and the capillaries and the photosynthesis capability that a leaf has. Just think about the design that goes into a leaf and then miniaturizing it. And God made that, I won't say as an afterthought, but God made that as a caveat or one part of a plant. God made the animals. God made the earth. God made things we still haven't discovered on this earth. God created the universe. He's above and beyond it. The fact of the matter is that God has the right to be God, not only because of who He is, but because of what He's done. And friend, the third aspect of that is because of what Jesus has done. You could propose that God is unjust or God is unfair to be a judge. You could propose it. You wouldn't be right. But you could argue that it's not fair for God to judge had God not judged His Son. Judged Himself. See, the fact that Jesus died for our sins is such an important truth connected with the, the doctrine of the Godhead or the Trinity. God judged Himself. Why is it so important for Jesus to be not only God's Son, but God Himself? Why is that so vital? Well, because, my friend, God judged Himself. It certainly is reasonable for a judge to pass judgment on people when he's been judged for things he's innocent of, isn't it? People have a problem with God judging evil. Ultimately, God judging them because they don't think anybody ought to judge anybody, and they're all coming from a perspective of imperfection. And yet God judged His sinless Son 
for our sins, you think He has the right to demand that we account to Him for what He did? Yeah, He sure does. Okay? Let's go ahead and look at a couple of points in Isaiah 45, then we'll look at where, it come, where it's quoted in the New Testament. And that'll be it for our study tonight. First of all, in verse 20, Assemble yourselves and come, draw near together, ye that are escaped of the nations. They have no knowledge that set up the wood of their graven image and pray unto a God that cannot save. That's a polite way of saying stupid. Last night Taj was saying that um, he's probably heard me say more stupid more than any other pastor. And I just want to explain that for the children that are here that aren't allowed to say stupid. Saying stupid is one of the privileges of the call to be pastor. So you you can't say it. It's not nice. Don't call people stupid. Don't say stupid. But if you're preaching, you can. It's just one of those exception rules. you know. So ever since I got called to be a pastor, it took a while for me just to get in the rhythm of saying it. But uh, I only have the right because of my calling. Okay, so don't try it. Don't try it yourselves unless you become a pastor. Okay. That's a good explanation, isn't it, Lee? Is that, does that count? Does that work? Can help you with your children? Try to explain why pastor can say stupid, but they can't. It makes, it makes sense, doesn't it, Tosh? Yeah, okay. Pastor? Yes. He's an idiot. Yeah, well, that's another word. You have uh, only that most people shouldn't say. Not nice. Look at this. The, the, the Bible says stupid here. Look at this. They have no knowledge is another way of saying they're ignorant or they're dumb or they're stupid. They have no knowledge that set up the wood of their graven image of praying to a God that cannot save. You know, I think of all the things, some things in life make me sad. Uh, I was thinking yesterday, there are two, <laughs> I, I don't want to offend anybody, but there are two holidays that upset me as a pastor that I don't like. I don't like Halloween because it just acknowledges Satan. I mean, it's a satanic holiday, and so many people are like training their kids that it's just the most wonderful thing by just, by re you know, I mean, as a kid, what is better than going out, having a good time, dressing up, and getting lots of candy? It's a great thing, but it's it really is a wicked night. I, last night, when we, after we dropped off Kelly, we ended up driving back up for Wilton Manors, and just all the people out, and just imagining the evil things that people are doing and then realizing that Christians are teaching their kids to celebrate Halloween, and they'll probably be down in Wilton Manors one day when they grow up because they've learned that it's an okay holiday to celebrate. You know, frustrates me. You know, it makes me mad. I'll tell you the other holiday I, I don't like anymore very much, Easter. I don't like Easter much. Uh, I like it for myself, but it grieves my heart when Christians don't go to church on Easter because they're all having dinner with their family. It just breaks my heart. I mean, it just, just makes me sad. There's just some things in life that make me really sad. And I realize this is the most significant thing that's ever happened is that Jesus Christ is risen. And the greatest celebration is when the church gets together on Sunday, which is the resurrection day or the Lord's Day, to celebrate. And a lot of Christians aren't going to come because their family that doesn't normally go to church are going to have an Easter dinner and they're going to be upset if they don't show up for it. And so they're not going to worship God on Easter Sunday and celebration of Easter, and it just it ticks me off. It makes me sad. It just makes me just it grieves my heart. To be honest with you, and something else that grieves my heart is idolatry. I remember being in South America, and there, and yeah, we were in Guyana, and watching a guy that would get up every morning and he had a rock on a jack stand, and in his yard, and he would get out in the morning. And he would sit there or bow next to this rock and just meditate and like worship this rock. Little rock, just a little rock sitting on a jack stand. And it was like his family God. And I just I just thought, man, that's so tragic, it's so sad. That man is bowing to a rock. And it, it seems funny, but it's really sad. This man is is literally trusting in this rock for virtues that God has. It's tragic, isn't it? Yeah, it's kind of comical when you look at it, but when you realize here's a soul who is going to someday answer to God, it's really tragic. It just grieves your heart. You just think, man, worshiping a stick or worshiping something carved out of a piece of wood or worshiping a rock or something chiseled out of a rock or worshiping an image or something uh, cast 
in an image of somebody or something. It's just tragic because man made that and God made man. And it's right for man to worship God, not something he makes. And so the Bible says they have no knowledge. Or is it... You're wrong. You don't know what you're talking about. You know what you're thinking about. Why can't I worship idols and worship God? Because you have no knowledge. If you think that that's acceptable or that's real or that's legitimate, it isn't. Uh, verse 21 of Isaiah 45, Tell ye and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together who hath declared this from ancient time, who hath told it from that time. Have not I the Lord? And there is no God else beside me. Hey, why is it we should only worship God? Because He's the only God. Now, when God says, Thou shalt have no other gods before Me, He's not arguing for primacy or to be primary or to be first. Get it? When God says, Don't have another God before Me, He's not saying, You know what? I just want to be number one God. What He's saying is, There isn't any other God. No one else created the world. No one else made man. No one else sent his son to die for sin. So what kind of sense at all does it make to worship anyone but God? There isn't another God. In other words, anything but worshiping God, friend, I want to solidify this in your mind. Worshiping anything or anyone but God is to worship something that is non-existent or to worship the one who is pre-existent. Yeah? Question. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry to throw it off. Uh, this has always come up with some people I meet or maybe family and stuff. What? How do you explain the difference between God that we know in the Bible and Allah? Yeah, well, origins, the origin of Allah. Uh, well, you would simply just have to look at what Muhammad, at, look at the, the history of Muhammad and even uh, it's 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 a boring read, but even read the Quran and look at uh, Muhammad. The fact is, is that Muhammad came from a pagan family. Muhammad's background was that he was raised, he was kind of raised sort of as an orphan, and he was raised by Catholics and by Jews. And so he had an understanding of Catholicism and Judaism a little bit, but he also had his family religion, which would have been the worship of the gods of Allah. Mm -hmm. uh, there would have been the god Allah of Moon, Allah Earth, and Allah Sun. They worshipped three. They were just pagans. They just worshipped three gods: the Sun, Moon, and the Earth. And so, when uh, when he was developing his religion, I, I don't want to get too much into Islam specifically this evening. But when he was making up his religion, one of the things he did early on was he said, because of his roots in Judaism and Christianity, because he was trying to to make a connection to that, mm -hmm. he said. You know, Allah is one God. Uh, and then his family said, you better not say that or we'll kill you. And then he wrote in the Quran, oh, Allah is three gods. <laughs> you know, the sun, the moon, and the earth. And then later on when he became more powerful than his pagan family, he switched back. And that's still in the Quran. Uh, he didn't write the Quran, by the way. Muhammad didn't. Uh, he, he, didn't he didn't know how to write. So somebody else wrote it for him. And so he probably would have scratched it out himself if, you know, he was an illiterate man. And I don't mean to... He, he, was, he was intelligent, but he was illiterate. In other words, he was uneducated. He was smart, but uneducated. He was very manipulative and understood a lot of things. But does that answer the question? So what would be the difference? Yes. Well, the difference is that Muhammad made up Allah. I wasn't saying that I... I yeah. No, no, I understand that you oh. don't... Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a great question. It's connected. Yeah. Oh, it's the same God. No, it's not. Right. It has different origins. See... Where we find God is in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and we we're introduced. Here, I'm God. In the beginning, that's where God started from. Allah started after Muhammad made him up. The keys, they had different origins. Yeah, that's what I, is that what I said? Yes. Yeah, yes. they had different origins. You know, God, <laughs> God has no beginning. He's eternal, pre existent. He's God. He's the only one like him. And again, that's what the text is saying. God is saying, Who are you going to worship beside me when I'm the only God? And so God isn't saying primacy. See, that's my point. Primacy means number one. God's not saying, I want to be primary. I want to be the most important God. You know, I want to be dominant as God. What He's saying is, there's no other God. It's always tough to compete with the imaginary, isn't it? How would you like to be dumped for an imaginary relationship? 
You know, you're dating a girl and she says, you know, I'm breaking up with you. Oh, is it someone else? Yes. Who is it? Well, I imagine them. That'd be tough, wouldn't it? Dating a guy and you like him a lot and breaks up with you. And you say, why? I've got someone else. Who? Do I know him? Nobody knows him. I made him up. They're imaginary. <laughs> Somebody really doesn't want to be with you when they break up with you for someone that doesn't exist. Right? That's what idolatry is. Worshiping a, a God that doesn't exist rather than the God who does exist. If you're as intelligent as I am, that's dumb. But if you're God, can you imagine? You can just imagine it must be a lot dumber than what I can understand. I said dumb a lot. But remember why I can say dumb? Remember why? Part of my calling. Verse uh, 22. Look unto me, and be ye saved all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is none else. No other God can save. There is no other God, and no other God can save. Make sense? It's exactly what, what God is saying. Look to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. You're worshiping wood images or idols without knowledge. Instead of that, look to me. Now this is very magnanimous in my opinion. I'm not sure if a girl dumped me for an imaginary guy if I want them back. Right? Every person is born with the knowledge of God in their hearts. And if anyone worships anyone other than God... They're worshiping an imaginary God. And it's like, no God, instead I'll worship a fake God. Literally. Now it would be different, wouldn't it, for a person who's born into religion? Wouldn't it? It would be different for a person who has been deliberately taught otherwise. And God's very magnanimous. Very generous. He says, look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth. Now, is that just Israel? All the ends of the earth? No, that's everybody. You know, God's always been that way. Even in a uh, prophecy of the Scripture with Israel's prophet Isaiah speaking to the nation of Israel, God's Word specifically says, look unto me and be saved all the ends of the earth. God's plan always has been to save everyone, whosoever will call on Him. And it's very, very forgiving, merciful, God. The message this evening is very, very simple. We want to answer the question. Why only God? Why is it only Jesus that can save? Why can I only worship God? Because He is the only God. That's the reason why. And because there's no other God beside Him. And it's because He's a generous God who says, look to me. See, most of the time the attitude that people have is, why is God forcing me to worship Him? People don't want to be forced to worship God. And you know, God doesn't force anyone to worship Him. But He does judge them for turning away from Him. Why does God have the right to judge people who turn away from Him? Because He judged His Son. See, it answers all those questions in the text, doesn't it? Now verse 23, I've sworn by myself, the word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness, and shall not return that unto me every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall swear. Surely shall one say, In the Lord have I righteousness and strength. Where is the source of righteousness and strength? In the Lord. Uh, Even to him shall men come, and all that are incensed against him shall be ashamed. Do you see this? Unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. Now here's the reminder, friend, and this is where we as believers really become compassionately galvanized in our steadfast preaching that Jesus is the only way. We should be compassionately galvanized in steadfast preaching that Jesus is the only way. Why? Well, because Jesus is the only way and because the day is going to come when every knee bows, every tongue confesses. You know, some people think just because they won't 
acknowledge that Jesus is God, that they'll never have to. And it isn't so. You can either bow now or you can bow later, but you'll bow. You can bow now or bow later, but you will bow. The day is going to, be, going to come when you come before that great white throne judgment where God judges the dead and God judges the wicked. And when God judges the wicked and God judges the dead, they will not be standing facing Him. They'll be falling on their face. They will not be able to stand in His glorious presence. And they will not be able to say, I don't believe in you. They'll be before Him and they'll be bowing before Him. And that's the reality. You say, Pastor, I, you know, I just don't know if I like that. Well, friend, it really God isn't really asking for opinions on this. You know, He's not saying, well, let me, let me run this one by you and see if you think this is a great way to settle everything. This is the way it is. This is who He is. He's God. He's judged His Son. He's right to judge the wicked because He judged His Son for the wicked. And if they rejected His Son, they, they have made the choice to stand before Him and bow before Him. I always say stand before Him, but it's just an inaccurate way of putting it. They've made the choice to bow before Him in their sin instead of escaping that judgment because His Son stood in their place. My friend, Jesus died on the cross for your sins. He died on the cross for my sins. He died on the cross, the Bible says, not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. There's no one who will bow before that great white throne, that judgment of God toward the wicked, for whom salvation, deliverance from the ends of the earth was not intended. God's plan, God's intention for every person is that they would escape judgment. And every person that goes to judgment went there because they would not bow now. And so they've bowed later. And friend, when we come to this reality, it ought to, as Christians, strike us of the importance of warning people. Mm -hmm. Well, they may not want to hear it, but sometimes hearing it's what people need. You will bow. You don't want to bow, but you will. You will bow before God. By the way, this is an important aspect of parenting. If you're a parent, you know, at a certain point, you know, your kids are going to have a strong enough will that you're just going to drive them against you if you try to, try to teach them submission. But you know, it's important for parents to teach submission because if they don't submit to you, they won't know how to submit to God. It's very, very difficult for a person who has never been forced to do anything to say to God, well, God, then you know what, I guess, I guess you could be an authority in my life. Nobody's their authority. Prisons are full of people who've never bowed. Hell is full of people who've never bowed. And it's very important, very important to have a person realize, you know what, I do not control my destiny. God does. If you never learn that, it's important just acknowledge it. To say, okay, wow, God, you got my attention. I will acknowledge this is true. And I'll bow. Bow before you. I will surrender to you, to who you are. Why is God right to demand that people only bow to Him? Because He's the only God. Why is God right to judge? Because He judged His Son. You see, it's pretty simple actually, isn't it? Who will one day bow before God Every knee shall bow. Go to Romans chapter 15, will you please? And we'll finish up tonight. Romans chapter... I, I, I uh, misspoke. I wanted to go to verse 14. I intended to say... Romans 15? No, Romans 14. Is this thing on? Yes. Okay. Romans 14. I like to ask you that. Uh, this is where the Scripture discusses... Uh, eating meat offered to idols. And by the way, I've heard this passage of Scripture preached with the wrong conclusion I don't know how many times. The question really ought to be, does God forbid believers eating meat that's been offered to idols? And the answer is yes, He does, actually. See, there's a couple of issues in Romans 14. One is meat offered to idols, and the other is eating meat at all. But Acts chapter 15 very, very plainly delineates that we as believers are not to eat things strangled or uh, meat offered to idols, and we're not supposed to uh, we're not supposed to commit fornication. And the Bible very very plainly says that. And so, in the middle of this passage of scripture.
we see an argument beginning in verse 5. One man esteemeth one day above another, and another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Uh, you know a good way to illustrate this for me? I have it written in my Bible, a birthday illustration. Uh, today, Mr. Taj thinks this is a special day. And I'll be quite honest with you, I didn't feel anything when I woke up. But he thinks because it's his birthday that there's something special about it. Right? He esteems this day above another. Matter of fact, there are 365 days in the average calendar year, and Brother Taj doesn't care about the other 365 days the way he cares about this day. And Sophia was kind of like that yesterday on her birthday. And Daniel on the 13th coming up is going to feel that way about his birthday. And, you know, if you're no, how many November people are there in here? There's just too many, aren't there? Oh, Luke, too? Oh, oh, man. Wow. When is yours, Luke? The 11th. Oh. Oh, too much. Anyway, these individuals esteem a day above another. Get it? It's my birthday. My birthday. Well, you know, that's maybe special for you, but not for me. My birthday is special for me. Right? Not really. I forget my birthday a lot of times. I always schedule something on my birthday. Uh, the reality of it is, is that one man esteemeth a day above another, another day esteemeth every day alike. You know, if we celebrated every birthday every day, it would be a holiday. People are born like every day. Go to the hospital, check it out, you'll see what I'm talking about. I've been in the hospital a lot lately. I've noticed people are getting born there. So, it's reality. Smile, people. I'm almost done. All right. Uh, one day, man esteemeth a day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Now, might it be special to a person to have been born a particular day? Yeah, it would, wouldn't it? Okay. Now, in verse uh, 7, or verse... Six, we see the importance of effect, our effect on others. He that regardeth the day, regardeth it unto the Lord. And he that regardeth not the day, the Lord he doth not regard. I just want you to know, Taj, I am not regarding this day unto the Lord. Okay, So this is unto the Lord that I regard it not. So I hope you're right in your way of regarding it. I know I'm right in mine. So there you go, buddy. We celebrated his birthday yesterday, so I'm a little bit tired of it. Uh, he that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not, to the Lord he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. Verse 7, now notice this. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. No one lives in a vacuum. There's no one anywhere whose living doesn't affect someone else, or whose dying doesn't affect someone else. Now this may seem simplistic, but actually it's rather an important truth. Every single one of us affects somebody around us. Every one of our lives overlap and they touch the lives of other people. You'd be surprised how your lives affect mine. You might. You might be surprised. Uh, you'd be surprised how when things are not going well in your life, how it grieves my heart. It affects my life. It affects my day. It affects things. You don't live to yourself. Uh, I don't think I'd be surprised at how my life affects yours. The things that I do, the way I respond, what happens around me, man, it, it affects everybody. I can't, I can't make a bad decision and not hurt our church. And I can't be wrong and not hurt people. It's just the reality of it. And so that's the passage of scripture. That's the text of the scripture. The things we decide to do, particularly in the matter of Christian liberty, are actually couched within the reality that we affect others with what we do. So something may be okay for me, but if it's a hindrance or if it is damaging to my brother or sister, that's a consideration I need to take, right? So that's part of our context. And then the Bible says in verse 8, For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be the Lord, both of the dead and the living. Now, but why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Now this is judgment seat. And we see in verse 11, the Bible says, For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. Now notice verse 12. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Now this evening I want to conclude. See, I believe that primarily Isaiah 45 is talking about great white throne judgment. And I, uh, Romans chapter 14 is speaking of both, but spe specifically to the believers is speaking of judgment seat. Every one of us will bow. We'll either bow at the great white throne, as is referred to in Isaiah 45 when it's talking about the people who are worshiping idols and unbelievers. 
or we will bow at the judgment seat where God rewards us for how we live this life, but we'll bow. And it's for this reason that Jesus, the Bible said, died, was buried, and revived. Or died, arose, or was buried, arose, and revived. And the application for the lost is, Look to me, all ye ends of the earth, and be saved. I'm God, there's, I'm the Lord God, there's none like me. And the application for the believer is that, we need to look to the Lord Jesus in the same attitude, same way, and we need to be aware. Isn't it interesting that the context in which Isaiah 45 is quoted when it's talking about the lost looking to Jesus, isn't it interesting that the context in which it is quoted is the effect that believers have on each other or have on others? Do you ever put that together? you ever notice that? What's the significance then? What's the significance? Well, it matters how we live. It matters how we live toward each other, and I think it matters even more how we live toward the lost, the people that don't know Jesus. And my friend, you and I need to be very, very concerned. Christian, what happens when a believer drags the testimony or drags the name of Christ through the mud? What happens when a believer doesn't live in victory, doesn't walk in victory? Well, it doesn't encourage people to bow to their God, does it? What happens when a believer doesn't warn the lost, the wicked, to come to Jesus, all the ends of the earth, and be saved? Well, my friend, it has pretty drastic consequences for them, actually. They'll meet God as a, as a judge of the wicked instead of a judge of the righteous. But we're all going to bow. And that's the completed context. I hope that was an interesting study for you this evening. I hope it answers some questions that you have. Why only Jesus? Well, I'll tell you why. Because there's only one God. And that, you know something? Sometimes the simplest answer, sometimes you could try to answer a simple question in a complicated way, but it doesn't have a complicated question. Why only Jesus? Because He's God. He's the only one. And that's a good enough answer, isn't it? There's no other God who's a creator. God doesn't just prefer to be number one. God is the only one. Father, please cement in our minds the truth and the application of it from what we've learned this evening. We ask for your help with this. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, let's take some prayer requests this evening. Let me mention uh, some things that have been phoned in for me uh, to pray about. Pray for the Al Miller family. They're just going through some things right now. And, uh, they, they just asked if we mentioned, Brother Al mentioned, I uh, asked if we would mention them in prayer this evening. So pray for the Miller family. And then pray for Brother Scott Dewey down in Miami Beach. His cousin actually died. He's got to go up to a funeral in Wisconsin, in Appleton, Wisconsin, uh, for this weekend. And incidentally, he will not be in service on Sunday. But uh, pray for uh,